clinical research uh, in translational biomark biomarker discovery for chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer through development of bio repositories with clinical databases. Uh, I myself enjoyed his latest uh, evening talk on pancreatic lesions. It was really excellently done. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, and I want to thank the organizers as well for the uh, kind opportunity to uh, be here today. It's great to be back in person. So um, I'm going to go over, well, sorry. So I'm going to talk briefly about chronic pancreatitis and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Um, and in contrast to the IBD world, while there are many abstracts, I've chosen to kind of limit this to just three um, because Perhaps the pancreas, in this case, is a little bit less complicated because we don't have the whole MAB library of different medications. But hopefully in the future, I'll have a, a more complex and nuanced discussion of therapies. I'm going to focus on pain and chronic pancreatitis, and I'm going to talk about exocrine pancreatic insufficiency management. So as many of you know, uh, one of the hallmarks and key challenges of taking care of patients with chronic pancreatitis is the abdominal pain, particularly the, the, the nature of the pain and, and the refractoriness of it, and it affects up to 80% of patients. Um, the etiology and mechanisms of the pain are poorly understood, but the, the general paradigm is that, similar to what we see in um, functional pain syndrome, is that we have a plumbing mechanism of pain and we have a wiring mechanism of pain, right? So the plumbing mechanism, we have strictures, we have stones, we have ducts, we have ductal hypertension, which leads to pain, hence the logic of treating it with surgical therapy or endotherapy. And then we do see that in patients with chronic pancreatitis that there is some perhaps nerve bundle hypertrophy, and these patients don't quite respond to surgical or endoscopic therapy, um, but they do seem to have some response or partial response to neuromodulators, gi giving us the idea that there is perhaps some type of neuro, um, some, some neuropathy to that, uh, to that. Now, when you see a patient with chronic pancreatitis who complains of pain, you know, our physical exam really needs to move forward, right? We, we kind of percuss, we ascultate, but, you know, and, and how a patient perceives pain is, is a very subjective process, right? We can take 10 people who stick their hand in a cold bucket of ice water, and they're, not, they're all not going to say it's 6 out of 10, because what patients experience and what they bring to their pain perception will also vary. So it's a very subjective process. So that's part of the conundrum of how do you manage this pain. The general paradigm is we start with medical management. We start with anti-inflammatories. We try to avoid opiates, particularly in this day of age of trying to minimize that and its negative effects on, on the GI tract. We think about neuromodulators. And of course, we look for opportunities for endoscopic therapy, whether there is some type of obstruction. Um, well, I'll talk a little bit about celiac plexus block today in one of the abstracts. And then for those who truly are refractory that we seem to have not made much success for, we think about surgical therapy, whether it be segmental resection or a total pancreatectomy with islet autotransplantation. So with that set setting, I'm going to talk about abstract 650, which was a multicenter study from the University of Pittsburgh, Johns Hopkins, and Alberg University in Denmark. And, and they've been trying to move the needle forward on how do you start to reproduce, standardize, and measure pain beyond subjective kind of um, assessments. On, and on top of that, it's recognizing that there are these central pains or hyperalgesia pathways that if we could better and more reliably identify, then perhaps we can be a little bit more precise about who we treat and how we treat them. So, um, so they developed this test called the Pancreatic Quantitative Sensory Testing, or PQST. And they developed it in Denmark, and they've, and they've, and they've had some um, preliminary success there. And then this was a multi-center study that involved Hopkins and Pittsburgh, where this involves a repetitive pinprick of five different sites on the right side, as well as a pressure stimulation, as well as a cold presser test. Now, this is obviously not prime time. We're not teaching it yet at the clinical bedside. But they've done an extensive amount of work of validating it, teaching it, trying to determine how they can re reproduce it. Um, and they've been now studying to assess the presence of central pain pathways, or, and to particularly identify hyperalgesia. And what they found is that they might, through these tests, be able to identify a couple phenotypes of pain. One is the widespread central um, hyperalgesia, or segmental, or the negative, uh, or negative absence of any of these where they have no central pain processing. And so that's kind of how they've been using these tests to kind of categorize three phenotypes of pain. And so this was an international prospective multicenter study, and the hypothesis was that patients with refractory pain 
may have central segmental hyperalgesia. And so they defined pain response as a reduction of 30% on a, on a VAS pain score measured at enrollment. And these were patients who were gonna undergo some type of invasive therapy, most commonly ERCP with ESWAL or extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy or surgical resection of total pancreatectomy with auto islet transplantation. And then they had, and they remeasured, um, they, re, they reassessed pain uh, six months later. So they did the PQST at enrollment and they did the VAS, then the patients underwent the invasive treatment, and then six months later they remeasured the VAS. And then they tried to categorize it, determine to what extent did the PQST predict who was going to respond and who wasn't. So this was a pilot study. Um, this is an interim analysis, and they only enrolled 30 patients, and the mean pain score prior to invention was uh, 4 out of 10, plus or minus 2. And uh, pain response of greater than 30% at six months was achieved in 16 patients, about half the population who underwent either a TPIT or um, ERCP with as well. Um, and among the patients that were categorized as having no hyperalgesia, meaning they had negative tests on the PQST, 60% of that subset actually pre will, um, comprised that cohort that appreciated a benefit. 63% in the segmental hyperalgesia arm. And most interesting, the patients who had widespread hyperalgesia, only 20% reported a benefit at six months. So the, 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 the potential idea is that perhaps with uh, some more objective, standardized physical exam testing, such as PQSD, we may be able to identify patients who may have widespread or centralized hyperalgesia, and that these patients with, quote, refractory pain from chronic pancreas may not benefit from perhaps heroic treatments um, of the third or fourth ERCP with ESWAL or the TPIT, and that they still may, may continue to have pain afterwards, and, and, and understanding who is more likely to have those types of outcomes can also improve our patient management. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the idea of that study, and it's, again, not prime time, but I, would, I brought, bring it to your attention because I think uh, if this does continue to work, if the, the eventual study is a positive result, then we could potentially be using this more frequently. And this may have ramifications beyond pain from chronic pancreatitis, but even just pain in general uh, in our physical exam. The other abstract that focuses on pain and chronic pancreatitis is about celiac plexus block. And this was a study from the University of Wisconsin. So when medical management fails or we need to reduce opiate medication usage, sometimes we need to, we need to escalate pain treatments. And celiac plexus block has been somewhat of a controversial um, means for treating chronic pancreatitis-related pain, the efficacy, partially because the efficacy rates range from 30 to 70%. It's really all over the map. Um, and frankly, um, I, going into my practice, was a little leery and, and skeptical about doing celiac plexus blocks for pain from chronic pancreas because I felt it was really more than a flip of the coin. But then working closely with some of my pain colleagues, I guess it all depends, are you a half empty or half full? When I said 50%, I, I had concluded, therefore, it was like nothing better than placebo. But they were like, wow, so there's a 50% chance it could work? So, so they kind of convinced me otherwise, well, why not give it a shot? I and mean, part of it's what do you, you know, deem the risk-benefit profile? Um, but so I think because they were doing it a lot more, and they were doing it percutaneously, of course, and you, many of you are familiar with their technique and how long those needles are, they convinced me to start doing it more. So I, I've started seeing my practice that I do them more. Um, but celiac plexus block typically uses bupivacaine plus minus st a steroid versus neurolysis, which can include alcohol. I rarely use alcohol for uh, benign disease. So this was a single center retrospective study over five years at the University of Wisconsin just to look at um, the outcomes of endoscopically delivered celiac plexus block. And they um, looked at, um, they had 364 patients, but they only included 117 of these patients because um, only 117 had enough variables for their retrospective study. Um, and so what they observed was a, a, an efficacy rate of 32%. So again really not that great. So it depends, are you half full or half empty? Uh, and they look, were looking at risk factors to predict among that who actually um, predicted um, were, were more likely to constitute that population. Older patients tended to report a benefit. Um, alcohol to, and tobacco use, narcotic usage, and neuromodulators, on the other hand, were less likely to report a benefit. So I kind of bring this up because I think pain is a constant discussion about what can we do. Um, celiac plexus block, I think, still remains relatively controversial. Part of it depends on what you think of the risk-benefit profile. Where does it fit in your clinical practice? Again, I tend not to think of it as a long-term or sustaining treatment, but I will in, um, judiciously or 
try to use it in the setting where it fits in the context of a long-term pain management strategy, particularly if you're trying to wean patients off of opiates. So if you're trying to give them a jump start, you, I might consider trying it. Um, but I never, I never potentially use it on a long-term basis. Um, Anyways, the authors in this study concluded that maybe it should be used earlier because if patients were on neuromodulators, you might have less efficacy. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that conclusion. Um, and then, but there are some, um, I think the interest in endoscopically delivered um, treatments are continuing um, besides bupivacaine. You know, we could consider alcohol, we could consider um, RFAs increasing uh, in, in interest in use, as well as um, high intensity frequency ultrasounds. So there's a lot of other ways to deliver um, therapy that uh, might still give some potential uh, interest or uh, in this modality of pain treatment. So I don't think it's dead, but perhaps there may be another agent to consider. So I'm going to switch gears to talking about exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, which is um, essentially insufficient delivery of digestive enzymes to achieve adequate digestion. Um, there are approximately 200,000 chronic pancreatic pancreatitis patients in the U.S., about 15% will have EPI diagnosis, and up to 75% will develop it in the course of their uh, disease. Um, annual screening for EPI is recommended among patients with diagnosed chronic pancreatitis. Um, what does the screening actually entail? That can vary um, primarily. Um, it starts with symptom assessment for steatorrhea, bloating, weight loss, particularly for um, bloating for um, earlier signs of EPI. You know, we don't really have great tests, particularly in the U.S. Um, the 72-hour fecal fat's the gold standard, but that's, you know, I think we all know that's a challenge to get our patients to do that. Um, fecal assays has a lot of false positivities, um, and it's, but it's very tempting and attractive because it's really easy to get, easy for patients to do, um, but it can, without correlating clinical symptoms, um, there can be a lot of false positives. I, I would say it's similar to you know, if you think about what are the clinical criteria for acute pancreatitis, it's not just lipase elevation. It's two out of the three criteria of having abdominal pain or some type of imaging. And lipase elevation itself is not diagnostic of, of acute pancreatitis. Similarly, I would tell you a last days by itself in the absence of symptoms is not EPI. Um, and one of the reasons why we also want to do annual screenings because we do want to look for complications of uh, undertreated EPI, including fat-soluble vitamin deficiency, B12, zinc, uh, copper, and, and a list of studies that have really shown that these patients are at higher risk of osteoporosis and, and fractures. So what we do know is that pancreatic enzyme replacement treatment remains suboptimal, and there's many reasons for this. One is patient compliance and education. Uh, often insufficient dosage of PERT. Um, a lot of patients who are started on a, as low dose as possible, and they're often on two or 6,000 units with meals, and that's really for kids and not for adults. Um, misunderstanding about the timing of when to take it. Some will take it 30 minutes before a meal, perhaps thinking of PPIs as opposed to during a meal. Um, inadequate gastric acid inhibition. inhibition. These, um, uh, these enzymes really work in, in, in the, um, the non-acidic environment, and if there's too much acid, you'll get premature and often denaturization of these enzymes. Um, often that's um, overlooked as patients with altered surgical anatomy and or GI dysmotility, where you get asynchrony of the intestinal tract, so you basically don't have the enzymes releasing at the same time when you actually need it to be, and so you have to kind of work around that either by um, dosing up or, or changing the timing, or even going to a non-enteric coated or breaking the enteric coated to have earlier release. And then we want to think about concurrent GI comorbidities like an overlapping SIBO, particularly in the patients with um, surgical disease or GI dysmotility, celiac disease, IBD or biliary stasis, as well as diabetes, which is an increasing recognized risk factor. And there's a really kind of a, a bi-directional relationship into that, and that diabetes predicts risk of pancreatitis as well as acute pancreatitis um, predicts risk of acute of type 1 diabetes. There's a really interesting consortium that we're a part of now that estimates that after an episode of acute pancreatitis, your risk of diabetes in the first year is 30%. And, um, and intriguingly, um, a certain subset of that's actually type 1 diabetes. So we think that the acute pancreatitis actually is an inflammatory event that actually releases autoantigens that then stimulates a type 1 diabetic response. So it's an area that's of increasing interest, and a consortium has been created to look at that. So the abstract um, that I'm just presenting here is more of a health services research abstract about the administration and, and monitoring of 
of pancreatic enzymes. And this was a study done at the University of Florida by my colleague Chris Forsmark. Um, basically, I'm looking at um, the differences in specializations for treatment of EPI. So EPI is common after chronic pancreatitis, but not just chronic pancreatitis, but after pancreatic resection, uh, as well as those who are um, being treated for pancreatic cancer. Um, and screening and treatment is suboptimal, as I, as I hopefully have alluded to. Uh, and so the question is here, and this particular abstract was, do patients that are actually followed by gastroenterologists have higher rates of screening and adequate treatment? So this was a single center retrospective study of all patients with EPI, CP, PDAC, pancreatic section identified ICD-10 and CPD codes over, the, over two years. Um, and then once they were identified, they were validated by manual chart review. And they looked at for, um, and one of the variables was GI specialist continuity defined by two or more visits. They looked at a little bit under 1,500 patients, uh, of which 470 were associated, had some type of relationship with a gastroenterologist. And so here is just a simple table of um, some simple variables that they looked at as surrogates of kind of, uh, of management. So in one column, you had GI involvement versus those patients who had, who met these ICD-10 codes, but didn't have any GI involvement. And so you could see, so there's a couple ways you can look at this. Number one, if you were followed by a gastroenterologist, you were more likely to have a last day's ordered. You were more likely to have a PERT prescribed. You are more likely to have an adequate dosage. But there's another way you can look at this is that even when you're followed by a GI doctor, you still have suboptimal recognition and treatment. So there's an opportunity to improve and educate even within our own community. But ideally, we also need to educate the primary care community to make sure that they get to the right GI doctors who also then are educated and know when to think and screen and treat for EPI. Um, these are the odds ratios for being followed by a GI doctor versus a non-GI doctor, basically showing that GI doctors, were, if you were followed by a GI doctor for your EPI, you were more likely to get vitamin D testing, vitamin D, adequate vitamin D replacement, uh, hemoglobin A1C testing for the risk of endocrine insufficiency and type 3C diabetes, as well as um, recommendation for DEXA scans for osteoporosis. So in this study, almost 70% of patients were not followed by a GI specialist. So that's potentially one opportunity for improvement. Um, it, um, the, and this was associated with a lower compliance with EPI management treatment. Being uh, followed by a GI specialist, you did have higher rates of screening um, and as well as higher rates to assess for complications. But even then, there was an opportunity for improvement. I'll stop right there. Thank you. Um, great talk, enjoyed so much. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Asha Cogdill, uh, and I actually had a chance to chat with her before the meeting started today. And I just want to share with you that she is an, uh, one of the three major uh, IBS and motility disorder specialists in uh, uh, UC Davis area in Sacramento. She got her doctorate of medicine at UC Irvine. She proceeded with the residency in internal medicine in, at UC Davis and fellowship at UC Davis, and she's practicing and very happy being in Sacramento area. Uh, introduction and thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here today. So there were some very wonderful abstracts uh, presented at DW for functional and motility diseases. So I'm going to get right